Hello and good morning, church. It's great to be with you again. And if you're visiting with us, welcome to Hometown Church. My name is Tim, and I'm the campus pastor at Hometown Bloomington. Thanks for being with us today. We're in the middle of a series. We're looking at the book of Philippians and drawing out seven principles of emotional health given to us by, the, by Paul, the author of the book. This series has been fantastic. You know, I personally really enjoyed it and have learned a lot. I've enjoyed how it's brought us deeper into the text, yet been very practical and helpful, particularly in helping with emotional health in the crazy times we find ourselves living in. Perhaps you can relate to that. So this morning, Pastor Kit will be teaching on the importance of prioritizing what we choose to pursue in our life, specifically our pursuit of gaining Christ. You know, Paul, the author of Philippians, has some powerful and very profound things to say about this, and I think it's going to be amazing. So with that, let's pray and commit our service to the Lord. Father God, we thank you for this morning, and Lord, we ask you to please come here with power. We ask you, God, to speak through Kit, and Lord, I ask you to reach into the house of every person that's listening and just touch them and get their hearts ready and their minds ready to hear from you. Lord, let us, let us leave here this morning changed and transformed. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, before we get going, uh, there's a few people here that would like to say thank you for the amazing generosity that you all showed or many of you showed during the recent thank offering. So take a listen to this video. Hey, church. For the last three Sundays, people have been giving to our thank offering, and today I wanted to give you an update on those results. We took four initiatives from our 2020 Kingdom Builders plan and said we wanted those to be the top priority in the offering this year, and we set a goal amount for those projects. It was a revised amount because of COVID and the economy and the fact that we haven't hit our Kingdom Builders goal for the year yet. That amount for those four projects was $22,500. That seemed like an awesome goal to us, one that we would be very happy reaching because it's such a blessing to be able to give any amount away to other ministries. And as Pastor Tim mentioned a few weeks ago in the online service, if we raised above that amount, we would be able to support other great initiatives within Kingdom Builders that would advance the gospel in similar ways. Well, I'm excited to say that we far exceeded that revised goal. We'll be giving those ministries our full original goal amount of $37,500. Because get this, our thank offering total was $79,310. How amazing is that? It's really quite incredible. And you can imagine how thankful and touched those ministries are. Thank you so much for your generosity, Hometown Church. The money donated to Together for Good will be used to keep children safe and families together. Keep your ears open over the next few months for more opportunities to learn about Together for Good's ministry. And thank you again. Hey, Hometown Church. I want to extend a huge thank you for giving to the thank offering. On behalf of New Life Family Services, we thank you for partnering with us in this holistic Christian ministry that exists to honor the sanctity of human life. We appreciate it. Hey all, thank you. I am so encouraged by this church's response to the thank offering. I promise you that your love, that your generosity will be transformational. For the refugees on Lesbos Island in Greece, for those here in Minnesota, and ultimately for you. Thank you so much again. I can't tell you enough how encouraged I am as a pastor of this church to see your generous response in a year like 2020. With the extra funds that came in, we'll be able to support other Kingdom Builders partners like Run Global, which does church planting in Nepal and India, Treehouse, which fights to end hopelessness among teens right here in the, in the cities, and Immigrant Hope, which helps immigrants to the U.S. who live here in Minnesota with legal service, uh, services and practical love as they hope to become U.S. citizens. If you missed this opportunity to give above and beyond to the thank offering, that's okay. You can give to Kingdom Builders anytime by going to our website and by clicking the Give button. Soon we will share a more comprehensive 2020 Kingdom Builders update. But for now, let's just thank the Lord with a round of applause and a shout of praise wherever you're at 
for how he led us in generosity and how you all responded. Thank you so much. All right, church, we're going to spend some time worshiping now, singing to our King, the one who is worthy of all of our praise. So let's sing. Here we go. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We see your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. the storm inside of me let it rise let faith arise let it rise we'll see you break down every wall we'll watch the giants fall we cannot survive when we praise you the God of breakthroughs on our side forever This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Thinking not survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high with all creation cry, God, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. We cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high with all creation cry, God, we praise you. Holy infant 
so tender in my sleep in heavenly peace sleep in heavenly peace oh there's nothing The God of the mountains is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again.
God, that's so good. You are so good and you are so powerful. God, and we just want to take a second just to, to soak you in and to, God, just bring us into a place where we can see you as you fully are. Even if there's chaos around us and little hands needing something from us or a telephone call or something, God, wherever we're at right now, God, I just ask that you would just bring us into this place where we can see you and feel you and know that you're with us. God, where we can grasp your majesty and feel your tangible love at the same time. God, I pray that, um, that you, would just, you would just reassure us that the breath that's in our lungs, God, in this scary time, that you are, you are renewing and restoring us, God, that you create, God, you don't bring death, but you bring life. And so I just pray, Lord, that, that um, wherever we need to have that belief, God, that you would just speak to us right now, that you would bring reassurance, that you'd show us that you're with us, that you're walking with us no matter where we're at or what's going on, that we can just rest and know that you are beside us and that you're not gonna let us go. We love you and we praise you and we thank you for your presence. creation. We can see your might and your power, your steadiness. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will
2020 has been a year full of change and trauma. From the pandemic to the election, to riots and protests. This year has left many feeling emotionally exhausted. Join us as we dive into the writings of Paul from the book of Philippians and unpack seven principles for emotional health. I love and enjoy coaching sports. And I have thought coaching was something that I would do for the rest of my life. I have been fortunate enough to have coached different sports from youth level to college level. Unfortunately, I allowed coaching sports to become an, an, an obsession. After a couple of years of coaching football, coaching changed in value. I prioritize it over everything else. If you had asked me, then if coaching had priority over my family and God, I would have said no. But my action did not match my answer. My wife was affected deeply by my choice of priority. I abandoned my duties as a dad and husband to pour more time and effort into coaching. Many times, it was my wife putting the kids to bed without me and by the time I got home, I was too tired to hang out with her or to play with the kids. I was too busy watching films or working on practice and game plans. Now, looking back at my poor choices, I am not proud of these moments. I am sorry that my wife and kids had to experience them. Have you ever put too much stock into something only to find out it was not worth it? Have you ever said to yourself, if only I can reach this level or accomplish this dream or possess this thing, then I'll be successful, be happy, or feel good about myself? We have the tendency to chase after and attach ourselves to possessions and accomplishments because we believe these things have value and they will make us great or bring us success. After devoting our time and effort and energy to these possessions and accomplishments, we realize these things are not as valuable as we thought because they do not bring us the joy and the excitement that they promised. They leave us with a void, and we feel disappointed. Am I the only one who ever felt this way? I don't think I am. I think many of you might be feeling this way or have felt that way. If you have, you are not alone. The Apostle Paul came to a point in his life where what he had once considered valuable were not. What he thought that were, he had to reprioritize his life in order to gain Christ. Today, we are on principle number five, emotional health through gaining Christ. We are looking at seven principles for emotional health. Uh, through the life of Paul in the book of Philippians, in the last four weeks, we unfold four principles. Let us quickly review them. Principle number one, emotional health through self-forgetfulness. Principle number two, emotional health through trusting God's plan. Principle number three, emotional health through imitating Jesus. Principle number four, emotional health through pure motives. Our passage for this morning is Philippians 3, verses 1 through 4. Paul chose not to attach himself to any possession and accomplishments of this world. He considered all of them as garbage to gain Christ, the one who was able to strengthen his emotional health. Paul is helping us understand here that we become 
emotionally healthy when our relationship with Jesus Christ become our highest priority. Let's dive into the passage this morning. Paul started this chapter by encouraging the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord in all circumstances. So far, we have seen that rejoicing in the Lord is the main theme for this letter. The reason we rejoice in the Lord in the midst of our circumstances is because the Lord is the one who works all things together for good. The tone of the letter suddenly changed from rejoicing to a strong warning. Paul was concerned about certain dangers and spoke strongly against them. When he said this, watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. Paul was warning the Philippians against the Judaizers. The Judaizers were uh, a group of Jewish Christians who had adopted the Jewish religious practice and sought to influence others to do the same. Their gospel message was different from Paul's. We read in Philippians 1 verse 18 that Paul rejoiced when the gospel was preached. What makes this gospel preaching in Philippians 1.18 different from the one Paul is now rejecting? In Philippians 1.18, Paul was not concerned with the content of the gospel that was preaching, only with the motive of those who were preaching. Paul was also against anyone who preached a false or distorted gospel even if it was from the best of motives. Paul states how he feels about these uh, these false gospel in Galatians 1 verse 8. He says this, Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us, or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news, the gospel, than than the one we preach To you. Paul, the gospel message was this salvation by grace through faith. And the Judaizers' gospel message was salvation by grace and works. They add works into it through faith. These legalistic troublemakers were requiring the, the Gentiles to be circumcised before they could become Christians. The idea behind it, it was that someone must become a Jew first before they could become a Christian. They emphasize a right relationship with God by works. Paul referred to those with this legalistic idea as dogs, evil workers, and mutilators. Then Paul gave us the right concept of circumcision in verse 3. It says this, for we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human efforts. These Judaizers considered themselves as the one who were in the right relationship with God because of their circumcision. Paul knew that people who are truly in the right relationship with God are those who believe in the work of Christ and have been circumcised in their hearts through faith in Christ. Paul defined the the characteristics of true circumcision as worshiping God and the Spirit. Worshiping God uh, through human effort is formalistic. In other words, it's not genuine. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals God to us, not our efforts. And second thing, second characteristics, Paul says, relying on what Christ has done. There's nothing that we can do to put ourselves in the right relationship with God. And the third characteristics, 
is not putting confidence in human effort. We should not trust our ability to put ourselves in the right relationship with God through our own works. Does not work. What Paul wants us to understand this morning is that our hearts have to be circumcised by faith in Christ in order to stand in a righteous relationship with God or to stand in front of a holy God. Salvation cannot be attained by our human efforts or external achievements. That brings us to the next area of the passage, Paul's spiritual resume. And here's what Paul says. He says this, though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reasons for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. Paul said that if anyone thinks they have external achievements that will get them to a righteous relationship with God, he has more. In verse 5 and 6, Paul shares his spiritual resume, which include a list of his top seven most precious religious accomplishments and his life before he knew Jesus Christ. His accomplishments were what gave him a meaning and significance. Imagine with me that Paul has a ledger with two columns. And one side of the column, he writes, valuable. And for the other side, he writes worthless. Let's take a look at Paul's seven most precious religious accomplishments, which what I call the MPRA. Paul starts with circumcised. He was born in a godly family and his family obeyed the law. And next he goes, he was pure-blooded citizen. He's saying to us that he is one of God's chosen people. So he was born in the right country. He's, he's from the tribe of Benjamin. He came from a great family line. His tribe was one of the bigger and most prominent tribe. He claimed that he's a real Hebrew. In other words, he is born in a superior race. He's a member of the Pharisees. He, was, he has a membership in the highest religious sect in the Jewish culture at that time. And he claimed that he is zealous. He loved his religion, Judaism, that anyone who, has, who was against it was blaspheming God. The Christians who claimed that Jesus was God were blasphemers. So he set out to kill them. Paul counted knowing Jesus and the Jesus movement was worthless. So he put Jesus, a relationship with Jesus, in the worthless column. In regard to righteousness, he said that he was without fault. That means he obeyed every letter of the law of Moses. When there was something that needed to be done within the law, he did it. This is an impressive spiritual resume. If you are not impressed, it might be because you are not a Jew living in the first century. Paul had it all. He was highly educated. He had high social standing and a reputation for keeping the law. Paul was saying that he was more qualified than his legalistic opponents. If his top 10, top seven most precious religious accomplishments could get him into a righteous relationship with God, he would be guaranteed a front row seat with the rest of the great prophets because his spiritual resume was off the chart. That brings us to the third area of the passage, which is Paul's aim to gain Christ. He says this in verse 7, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them 
worthless because of what Christ has done. Paul begins to describe the wonderful transformation that he experienced on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, when God saved him, when he started to see life differently. He used to brag about his top seven most precious religious accomplishments and thought they were getting him to a righteous relationship with God. But now, he viewed them as worthless. If he was to continue to trust in them, they would keep him away from an infinite value of knowing Christ. In other words, from an infinite, from an intimate relationship with Christ. Paul rejected all the confidence he had in his effort and accomplishments. Paul is teaching us here that there is no amount of external achievement or religious work that, we, that, that will be able to replace an intimate relationship with God. We can go to church 24-7, serve in every ministry, and give all of our money away. And even though serving and giving are good and even commended, that cannot replace an intimate relationship with Christ. Knowing that, Paul was confident in saying this, yes, everything else is worthless. When compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, for his sake, I have discarded everything else, counted all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. Paul considered not only his most precious religious accomplishments as worthless, but everything in view of the infinite value of knowing Christ. Paul moved. He moved everything from the valuable column to the worthless column. And then he brought Christ into the valuable column. His intimate relationship with Christ ended up being in the valuable column. He called, he, he called all of his external accomplishments garbage. Paul's main purpose was to know Christ. The things that Paul held so dear were not worthless in themselves, but in comparison to an infinite value of knowing Christ that were all garbage. Paul joyfully accepted the loss of all things for his intimate relationship with Christ. He placed Christ at the center of his Christian life. The basis of his Christian life was in what Christ had done for him, not in what he had done, was doing, or would do. Paul show that life is better when we live in the righteousness God provides through Jesus Christ instead of in our own human effort. A couple weeks ago, uh, my youngest daughter and I were cleaning up uh, the, the game closet. As we were cleaning up, I saw the shoebox that has my card collection which I have not opened for a long time. I sat back and, and thought about all the time and money that I put into this hobby. When I was young, I used to collect basketball cards. I had a great collection of rookie cards, including Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson. I treasured these cards so much, I put them in a nice folder and took the folder wherever I went. Oh, I brag about them, so much that everybody knew that I had them. During my freshman year in college, I mistakenly left the folder on my desk with the door, with the room door open. By the time I realized it and went back to put them away, oh, the folder was gone. All the money that I spent and all my investment were gone in a flash. And still today, when I go online to check how much these cards cost or worth, I still feel bad. Paul knew something that I'm still learning today. 
He knew that the treasures of this world would not last. So he treasured knowing Christ above everything else. He says this in verse 10 and 11. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Paul was pleading with the Philippians uh, to not trust in their own human efforts or performances as ways to find peace with God. Jesus is the only way to God. So Paul aimed to gain Christ. Paul gave up. Paul, I'm, I'm sorry, Paul gave us an image of the intimate relationship with Christ that he was striving for. He says this, he wants to know the person of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean, what does it mean to know Christ? It is not enough to know about Jesus from someone else. We need to spend time with him by reading his word and invite him into our hearts and invite him to be with us and invite him to be every part of our lives. And second one, and Paul says that he wants to experience the power that raised Christ from the dead. This power is the evidence that everything that Jesus did and said was true. It is the proof that the sacrifice of the cross was accepted as a full payment. Those who are in Christ receive the same resurrection life. It is that power that will help us resist sin, overcome temptation, share our faith with others, and experience joy in the midst of our circumstances. And thirdly, Paul says that he wants to suffer, experience suffering with Christ. This is the part we would prefer to avoid. Knowing Christ means suffering with him. Paul made this statement in Romans 8, 17. He says this, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Paul also wants to share in Christ's death. Being in Christ means being like him in his death. It is denying or dying to ourselves on a daily basis. This was not a theory that Paul put together. He experienced more difficulties that you and I could have ever experienced. And he wrote this letter while he was in prison. Paul completes this section by saying this. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. It goes on. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forget the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Paul wanted to make sure that his readers had the right image or perspective of his life. He had an accurate self-awareness. He wanted to make sure that we did not misunderstand him. He had not arrived at perfection. He had not achieved all the things that he was trying to experience. He said the one thing that he did is to forget about the things he left behind and press on to what was ahead. There was no turning back for Paul. All of his focus was on finishing the race. 
and he would not allow the things he left behind distract him from his intimate relationship with Christ. Paul modeled what he saw in Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ considered you and me valuable. So he gave up his heavenly throne for us. He left it all to suffer and died on the cross so that we might be forgiven. He kept his eyes on you, on the prize, on you and on me, which is us, yes, being in the right relationship with God. Have you put your trust in him? Or are you still trusting in your own works or accomplishments to get you into heaven? Are you willing to trade your spiritual resume or accomplishments for an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ? Here's the application for today. What are some of the things that you are allowing to distract you from an intimate relationship with Christ. As you thinking about these questions throughout today and throughout this week, could you ask God to reveal whatever it is that distracting you? And as he revealed them, I encourage you to write them down and pray. And pray that God will help you move them to the worthless column and move Christ to the valuable column. Friends, let's aim for an intimate relationship with Christ, the one who can strengthen our emotional health. Remember, we become emotionally healthy when our relationship with Jesus Christ becomes our highest priority. Let's pray. God, we thank you for, for you, for the way that you love us. You love us so much that you send your son to die on the cross for us. You see us as valuable. You're willing to trade us for your son. And your son see us as valuable. He was willing to die. God, help us today to see a relationship with you as valuable in the same way you value us. In Jesus' name, amen.
What a great message. You know, I've had the opportunity to experience some incredible things in my life, but I can say without a doubt that my greatest desire and longing is deeper intimacy and closeness with Jesus. I trust that's true for you too. You know, the verse that stood out to me was verse seven. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. You know, hindsight is 2020 in our life, isn't it? I look back in my life and I can see so many pursuits that often consumed my life and my mind share. Pursuits that I really thought would bring me life. I think about my career. I think about some of the hobbies. I was even a, 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 cor a sports card collector like uh, Kit was. I even think of pastoring this church. Things that at the time seemed significant and were good, but often distracted me from pursuing a deeper and more intimate relationship with Jesus. I think we can all relate to this. So I want to encourage you to ask yourself that question that Pastor Kit posed. What are some of the things that you're, that you're allowing to distract you from intimate relationship with Christ? Take some time this week to pray and ask God to reveal them. And as he does, just like Kit said, write them down and pray that God would help you to move them from the worthless column and move them to the Christ, move Christ to the valuable column. I want to thank you again for being with us today. If you want to learn more about Hometown Church, just check out our Facebook page or our website. And if God is moving you to financially support the ministry here at Hometown, you can do that through our app or through our website. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.